This man, John Cooper, was convicted of a catalogue of appalling crimes. He is an armed robber, a rapist and a murderer who wrought havoc on a small rural part of southwest Wales for over a quarter of a century. But he was eventually caught thanks to some of the most sophisticated forensic work ever seen. Summer's Day in 1989, Peter and Gwenda Dixon were murdered on a scenic stretch of one of Britain's most popular national parks. They'd been tied up, shot and robbed. The brutal killings would become one of the most intriguing cases for David Powers police involving terrorist conspiracies, a massive manhunt and decades of forensic work, work which would eventually lead to the conviction of a serial killer. You must judge me after the trial, not before. Get down! Oh, oh. But the Dixons weren't Cooper's only victims. He terrorised the local area for 25 years, committing dozens of offences, including violent burglaries, <coughs> rape, and even another double murder. In the summer of 1989, Peter and Gwenda Dixon had been camping in Littlehaven, a popular spot on the coast in Pembrokeshire, in southwest Wales. But when the couple failed to return home to Oxford, their son raised the alarm, and a full-scale missing persons inquiry was launched. Five days later, their bodies were found by a police search team. They'd been hidden in thick undergrowth. The police were perplexed as to why someone would murder a couple in broad daylight in such a popular tourist spot. One suggestion was that the Dixons had discovered a secret IRA arms dump and had been killed to prevent them reporting it. There was various theories put forward. Um, drug, uh, drug running, uh, drug importation, that Peter and Gwenda starts, uh, Dixon may have stumbled on, on something of that nature, or potentially the, the IRA. But the most compelling evidence pointed towards it being a bungled robbery. Peter Dixon's cash card was used in the days after the murders, and police focused their investigation on finding a scruffy looking man seen hanging around at banks. But despite two crime watch appeals and thousands of police interviews, detectives were no nearer to catching their suspect. Everybody felt that one day we would have a name, the name would come forward, and we would hope to then be able to prove that this individual was the murderer. What we were aware of, of course, was that there was very little forensic evidence which we could use at that particular time. For years, it looked like the killer had slipped through the net. But in 2006, a group of detectives known as Operation Ottawa were tasked with reopening three previously unlinked serious crimes. Among them was the Dixons murder. One of the other cases was the horrendous murders of Richard and Helen Thomas. After being tied up and shot at their mansion at Scoverson Park near Milford Haven, the house was burned down in an attempt to destroy any evidence. Get down now! Get down! They also looked again at an attack on a group of children in 1996 on the Mount Estate in Milford Haven. The assailant had threatened them with a shotgun before raping one of the girls and indecently assaulting another. After two years of tirelessly sifting through thousands of old exhibits, witness statements and images, the team felt that one offender could be responsible for all three crimes. If you look at the ability of the offender to control multiple victims, the rural area, the use of violence, the use of a sawn-off shotgun, robbery, I could be either talking about the Dixon's murder or the attack on the children. For me, that was a significant linking factor when you then run alongside that, the fact that the Scoverson Park was only two fields away from the Milford Haven attack. And the name that kept coming up was that of a local labourer. John William Cooper had been uh, arrested and, and convicted in 1998 for a string of dwelling house burglaries which covered the same geographical area, Scoverson Park and the Milford Haven attack. In particular as well, he'd been convicted of an armed robbery. Right, sir! He'd attacked a lone female in the house. He'd tied her up. He'd threatened her with a sawn-off shotgun. 
he beat her around the head with a gun and he only fled the scene after the victim managed to, to raise the alarm. In a rare moment of panic, he threw his balaclava, gun and gloves into a hedgerow. These items would lead detectives to Cooper. Following his arrest, officers spent four weeks retrieving further evidence from his home and garden. The significance of what they found wouldn't become apparent for another decade. For me, the foresight of the people involved in the Huntsman Inquiry, the people involved in Scotland Park and the Milford Haven uh, offence, to retain the material in the manner that they did, the storage of it, um, that was one of the significant factors which al allowed us to conduct a, a, a methodical uh, investigation, a transparent investigation, and reach a successful conclusion. Cooper was given a 16-year sentence for the robberies. In the meantime, the new investigation into the double murders was in full flow. And although detectives were convinced he was responsible, they needed scientific evidence to back up their case. <coughs> they decided to re-examine the items taken from his house during the burglary investigations. Crucial was a pair of shorts taken from his bedroom. It was while we were looking at the surface debris from the shorts on sellotape strip um, for textile fibres that we actually discovered this tiny, this minute flake of blood. And so, of course, we immediately put it in for DNA profiling using our most sensitive technique because it was a really tiny flake. And we managed to get a DNA profile matching Peter Dixon. During yesterday's interview, John? Yes. And it was Cooper himself who, during his police interviews, would lead the team to their second discovery. It was a, a firearm which was part of the offence of the armed robbery in late 90s. And it was quite clear that that firearm was causing him significant issues. In the, the debrief after the interview, um, I think it was one of those eureka moments where we all were quite satisfied that that was the murder weapon, certainly for the Dixons, probably for the Thomases as well. So we went back to the gun and had a look and we found, um, we found both from the flakes and from the gun itself, we found that there was blood staining under the paint and again when we put it in for DNA profiling, the profile we got back matched Peter Dixon's and so we were absolutely sure we were on the right track by this time. Despite overwhelming forensic evidence, Cooper continued to deny any involvement. Have you any explanation to give as to how that blood could have innocently on the shorts? I really do not know. More worryingly is, my son used to take my clothes whenever he wanted, and that would be more of a worry for a father. Having resorted to blaming his own son, Cooper is now running out of answers. You know, I might have been called a liar. I'm trying to help you people. But the facts are, throughout this inquiry, the only person that we haven't been able to eliminate and whose name constantly crops up, be it forensically or otherwise linked to this offence, and see the offences as you. Okay. Because that's all you want to look at. The time now is 17.01, and no further questions, and we'll turn the tape recorder off. The decision was made to charge Cooper with all four murders and the rape. You must judge me after the trial, not before. Judge me after the trial. Do you want to go in? Yeah, you don't want to hear that, do you? Over nine weeks at Swansea Crown Court, the jury were told of the damning DNA and fibre evidence that linked Cooper to all three crime scenes. Twelve people from the communities of Wales listened to that evidence over that period of nine weeks and found him unanimously guilty of all charges. 25 years after John Cooper began terrorising this small area of South West Wales, the families of his victims had finally seen justice delivered. Horrifying man. Four life sentences he got. Yeah, judge me after the trial, we heard him say, didn't we? So we all can. I mean, he's a monster, a psychopath. The judge said the murders were of such evil wickedness that the mandatory life sentences would mean just that. He's not getting out. It was great to see the scientists there, uh, forensics, the judge said forensics really the key to this case. Yeah, the fibre evidence was astonishing, just as the DNA work was as well. Remember, they found a speck of blood the size of a grain of sand underneath the repainted shotgun. It was an incredible discovery, and there was great detective work as well. I mean, 
Cooper insisted that he looked nothing like the artist's impression of the suspect back in 1989, but detectives unearthed video footage of him on the TV show Bullseye a month before the murders. Let's have a look, because well, there it is. I okay. mean, there's no denying it, isn't it? It's been given. It's him. Um, you examined, when you were doing uh, this investigative piece, examined his background. What, what was in his history? What did you learn? It's violence. That is the common denominator over 30, 40 years. I mean, even with his own dog, when it became lame, he didn't take it to a vet, he dug a trench, and he spent half an hour clubbing it to death oh. with his shovel. I know. And that's what he was like in his personal life, in his crimes. That's what always jumps out, gratuitous violence. I mean, this guy, there are no redeeming features. He's now where he belongs. Yes, Matthew.